Welcome to another episode of Foolproof Theology. My name is Chase Davis, and I'm your host. It's great to be here again with you. I am in my office at the church here recording, and if you hear a kids movie playing in the background, well, that's just what, we've, what we're working with today. Um, today on the show, we've got Honest Youth Pastor. I actually didn't know his name until I Googled him before the episode, because uh, he goes by Honest Youth Pastor on everything. He's got hundreds of thousands of followers on Instagram, uh, not as many on Twitter, and we're going to talk about some of that as we get into it, but Michael Moore, not that Michael Moore, not the filmmaker, not Michael one. Moore, yeah. Honest Youth Pastor. Michael, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Oh, well, thanks for having me. Thank you. It's a long time working to get to this point. A lot of things have been in the way of making it happen, but yeah, we're here today. <laughs> we finally made it. All right. Yeah. Well, I wanted to hear more about you because I came across your content in 2020 when I was kind of looking around and I was going, man, I follow a lot of account- accounts that seem to be kind of compromised on some key issues going on in our world. And I wonder what else is out there. I come across this guy named Honest Youth Pastor. I'm like, who is this guy? Like, what is he? What is he talking about? Where is he coming from? And so that's my first question, because I still don't really know. I still follow you and enjoy your content. But maybe what what's some of your background? Uh, what's your church ministry background? Stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so I grew up in church and uh, got saved at a youth camp. Also happened to meet my wife at that same youth camp. And so when I was looking uh, for somewhere to go to college, I had felt called at that youth camp for ministry, and I had no clue what that meant. I just knew that that's a thing that they had mentioned uh, might happen. And so whenever I was looking for a college, she was going to attend a, a Wesleyan College uh, north of the state where we lived. And I thought, well, that sounds like a good as college as any. I mean, it was the denomination that we had, me and my family had gone to before when I was growing up. So I went ahead there, uh, graduated from uh, an Indiana Wesleyan University with a, a bachelor's of science in um, youth ministry, and then got to it, came back uh, to where her family had kind of grown up, got into youth ministry bilocationally, and did that for a long time, uh, about four years, probably right around. And then um, had volunteered at youth ministries before that, obviously, but that was the first kind of like time to be a youth pastor on my own. And then we had a transition within that church, which is how the, this the honest youth pastor account actually came to be. Ironically, it was a really weird transition. The, the pastor came in, we had totally different methodologies after the original pastor had basically been voted out. And, um, we tried to work together for a little bit. Then one day he came and he's like, Hey, by the way, me and the board talked about it. Uh, we're going to make you the children's minister and my son's going to become the youth pastor now. And I was like, Oh, that's weird. I don't really like that idea. I'm not sure where, where I was in this discussion. And so basically just a whole bunch of stuff went down really, really fast. I got a call on a Friday night, the Sunday before, and they were like, Hey, by the way, we'll just send your check. Don't come back. And so I needed a place to vent. Um, there's a whole, obviously a whole lot more to that story, but I needed a place to vent and the internet provided a perfect place. Uh, Instagram had just basically come around and, um, I didn't know what a meme was. My wife actually knew what memes were and she introduced me. So I was like, well, this sounds like a perfect thing because I can't vent on Facebook because literally everybody I just went to church with is there. And so I just started making memes on Instagram and venting about that. A lot of people seem to connect with that. And then it's obviously gone through a lot of different transitions since then. But that's how it began. I actually started people. I think when we got to like a thousand people, I was like, First of all, this is nuts and stupid, but if there's going to be this many people around, I should probably say something worth saying. And so that was the first time we kind of made the shift from just like me verbally vomiting on the internet about church hurt and moved more toward like theological sort of memes. And then it's kind of worked its way up to where it is today. So, okay. Yeah. That's, that's, fascinating. that's sort of the background. Yeah. Yeah. So y- you came onto the social platforms to try to like vent try to find connection, I guess, but mainly just to like share your thoughts. Yeah. Um, then you try to, you know, pivot a little bit and say, you know, I'm going to try to provide some helpful content. You know, part of your story is interesting because I think if somebody were to hear your story, it's like this guy is set up for deconstruction. This guy's venting about <laughs> church hurt. He's on a path. And yet you decided to, you know, double down on God's word. What did that journey look like? Did you go to seminary or did you stay in ministry? What does um, it look like? So probably after that happened, after that church transition happened, um, me and my wife were kind of dealing with that process differently. She had gone to this church her whole life. And so I had it. They, I just sort of kind of came into it. And um, so I, we were probably out of church for 
six or eight months and I kind of hopped around because I am just like super interested. I was like, if we're not going anywhere, I'm just interested in church culture then. So let's go visit all these other churches and see what all these random pastors are saying. And so I started going around by myself for a good while, um, kind of seeing, is there a church out here that isn't all about sort of attractional ministry? Because before we had left that church, we, the pastor bef- that had gotten fired was very like point driven, very methodology, methodological about like how we went through the scriptures. And the new guy was very much events driven. Let's like get the butts in the seat. And one of the reasons we didn't get along that well. And so I just was like, does everybody do this now? Is this what's going on? And then eventually after about six to eight months, I can't really remember the time, but it was a long time for me to be out of church because I had grown up in church. Somebody that had gone to that church that also left for a different reason invited us to the church we actually currently attend. And so I got plugged in there and I can't say in how gracious I am for them because especially my pastor, his name's Dave, he he was so he knew about the situation and was just incredibly gracious and kind just to welcome us in. The other people in the church were just, I mean, from the moment we walked in, friendly, they were family, they were Christ-like, and really just gave us time to heal. And so a huge part of that was being surrounded by believers that acted like Jesus and and, and were very gracious um, with, with people that were kind of broken at the moment. They were very like tore up about what had happened. And Dave just kind of let me sit there for a couple of years. And then one day he came up and said, hey, would you be interested in maybe preaching one Sunday for me? And so he let that time go. And like he knew <laughs> that it was like a very sensitive subject for me. And I wasn't, you know, how it all went down. And he, he was really gracious with me, gave me that opportunity. And uh, I said yes, because sort of the prayer that I had had was, God, like, I'm not going to chase after any ministry. If you want me to be in it, you're going to have to like just make it blatantly apparent because I'm kind of done with this. And so that was sort of the doorway back into that a little bit. And uh, now I preach once every Sunday. We lead Wednesday night Bible studies. And a lot of that was just, again, I think where we were set up to be like, well, the church is dumb. Christians are stupid. This is where it leads. Really was just this very gracious lady and her husband saying, hey, I know what you've been through. We were through it too. Just come visit this church. And just really being welcomed in in a way that was like to this day. I brag on them all the time. I tell them constantly, like, you don't know what you have here. Like, this is a beautiful thing. And um, I think that was the difference, honestly, was just having people there that were like Jesus. So That's excellent. So with youth ministry specifically, you'd served, you've been part of youth ministry. Mm-hmm. One of the things it's uh, that I think about a lot as a pastor is church today in America is very youth centric, almost mom centric in terms of like child care mm-hmm. and youth stuff. And we have a youth ministry to kind of like equip kids after the service on, uh, like they went through the Westminster catechism together, even though we're not Presbyterian, but yeah. you know, it's a helpful document <laughs> yeah. for sure. Um, and so they went through that last year, but I've always wrestled with how much of it is compromised into attractional ministry because mm-hmm. we segment out different population groups and, uh, and that can just get really squirrely really fast. So I'd love to hear maybe some of your some of your reflections on your time in youth ministry, maybe challenges, weaknesses, opportunities there uh, for yeah. churches today that are kind of like trying to minister to that age group. Yeah, well, when I was being, you know, getting that degree, a lot of that was a weird mix of attractional ministry with like exegesis and hermeneutics. And it wasn't there was never a bridge. It was just like do big events and I guess preach Jesus to them. And there was no real integration of either of those things. And then when you get in ministry, basically all the resources that are handed to you are just like big events. Like here is like, you can, you can go online right now and download an entire sermon series for youth right now with big things and like very generic sort of questions and intro things. And that's sort of what it's come to. Now we did a lot of the big events when I first did youth ministry and we tried to get a whole bunch of kids in there and like, just do the things that like got everybody there. that was probably the first two years and it failed epically. It was terrible. It didn't work at all. And then there was this pivot. And I always tell people this story because Mark Driscoll's like this big, terrible figure for people. I had found him in college. And then we went to one of his church planning boot camps, probably two years into youth ministry, because I was like, they were like, you know, plan a church. That's how you do it. And I thought, well, that's basically what we're doing. <laughs> so I don't know how to do that. So let's do that because the youth ministry before was very few kids. And so we went and did that and they just like preach Jesus, preach Jesus, preach Jesus. That's what you need to do. Just preach Jesus. So all of the, I mean, all of the disagreements I would have with the Driscoll, that right there at least was very helpful. And we went back and we did that. 
I just said, we're going to cut the rest of it out and let's just get in the Bible. Let's ask them what the questions they have about Jesus and get in it. And that was transformational to the entire thing. It, it exploded, not only with the kids that were in junior high and high school ministry, but when we started applying that to younger ministries, they exploded too. And we had kids coming in that were complete non-believers, but they they had questions about this this scripture that we said was it contained the answers and it exploded. And I've seen that. Obviously, the truth of that still continues now. We have a youth pastor now at the church I attend, and his name's Joe. And that's all Joe does. Joe's concern is, I need you to know how to read the Bible. We're going to wa- work through books of the Bible. And I'm happy to answer your questions, but you, you need to talk to your parents. And I'm here to equip them and help Like if there's a, a in between. And me and Joe talk about it all the time. But I think that's, that is what really pure youth ministry should be, is like, I'm not here to be your party buddy or your big excitement or whatever. I'm here to help facilitate what the word of God says, like teach you through it, teach you how to learn through it. And then your, your parents are the ones that are really supposed to be leading you through this. And I think those two things are kind of warring together within the culture right now, especially within youth ministry of attractional ministry versus like, let's dig in and finding that balance a little bit. So, yeah, that makes sense. So that, you know, I've been out of youth ministry. I grew up in a a mega church, 20,000 person church in Dallas and the youth ministry was giant. I just got lost Mm -hmm. in the crowd. I kind of found a ministry called K life, which is connected to can camps. And that was more like 30 people, more my speed. And, uh, and I found it really helpful at the time, but I'm curious about your thoughts on like the questions I was asking when I was in high school, 2000, 2005, you know, I wonder what are the predominant questions when you're presenting the scriptures, when you're talking about Jesus with youth, what do you think? How do you think those questions might be different than they were, you know, 15, 20 years ago? Mm-hmm. Well, they're, I think they're way different now. I mean, now, basically all the questions that come up are about relationships, about sexuality, about authenticity of scripture, basically. Like if you say this is the kids now, and I've had this conversation, not with just my friend, Joe, that's a youth pastor at the church, but just a lot of, a lot of students is that like, the, they're way more, they seem far more mature now than I was when I was their age. I mean, I have a teenager and I don't remember being as mature as she seems to be now asking the question she was. I was concerned about like video games and she's like, well, yeah, what about this truth? (laughs) And I'm just like, I don't know if I processed that when I was your age. And so I think the questions have changed because the culture they live in is completely different. I wasn't, I mean, you could tell me something, I'd probably believe it or not believe it when I was a student, but now the questions, because they're surrounded by it, or is this, can I even trust this? I mean, they're, they're so much more postmodern than I ever was. Like, can I trust this? You say this about sexuality. How do I even know that's true? And how, did, how is this document even authentic? And I think that's the difference is that they are, the good news is they are very much open to talking and dialoguing about it. And they want authentic truth. It's just they don't know where to find it. And that's completely different than 10 years ago in youth ministry where it was very much uh, the questions were a lot different um, than they are yeah. now as far as even yeah. what you base them on. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. Um, so you mentioned earlier, you know, you were kind of just ranting or whatever you were on Instagram, you got some yeah. followers. When, when would you say it kind of took on a brand identity with honest youth pastor and that kind of thing? Like when did it pivot? Um, I don't know if it ever pivoted as much as grew into it. Like originally the honest youth pastor thing was to be anonymous. That was the idea is that if I can just rant on the internet and if somebody happens to find it that I know it, you know, it won't even matter because they don't know it's me. Cause again, it's not directed at anybody. It's just me vom- verbally vomiting on the internet. Um, when I started putting my name out there, I guess, I guess you, maybe that's where you put where it became like a brand thing, which is still not, I, I'm not like, real jazzed about the idea of calling it a brand or even a ministry, because in my opinion, basically all I'm doing is like, all right, these are my opinions. This is where I come from. This is like what I'm saying. And it's, it's odd. And I try to push back where people are like, well, you're saying this authoritatively. Well, yeah, but I'm only saying authoritatively because I'm pointing to the Bible, not because I have pastor, you know, I'm ordained or anything. It's just like, here it is. But I would say if some people still, you know, wouldn't see it a brand, some people would. It's just an odd place. Like that for me is a weird thing. I think it just yeah. kind of grew into what it is. So, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's a weird thing. I've had a guest on my show. I talk about it where it's like when you're doing stuff like this, whether it's a podcast or Instagram account and mm-hmm. you're out there, the monetization, the way you describe it, you know, who you're responsible to, who you're accountable to. These these things, they should yeah. uh, they should at least give you a little bit of pause rather than just yeah. like a full on embrace of like, 
no, I'm a social media influencer. It's like, well, well you know, it's easy. a joke around my house. If, if we want to make my daughter cringe, we just go, Hey, I'm a, I'm an influencer. And then she goes, yeah, sure you are. And so it's just, it's just, it's really a joke around, around here because it's just sort of, my wife's like, yeah, I'm sure where, if you're an influencer, why are you working 50 hours a week in another job? I'm like, ditto. Cool. Totally, totally legitimate question. So <laughs> that's great. Um, you know, when I got more active on particularly Twitter in 2020, 2021, um, I'll, I'll, there were a lot of concern bros out there uh, who started, you know, asking some some questions that were just kind of top of mind for them. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that that comes up is like for a lot of Christians, they kind of view Christians online as like causing division. And it's like they would rather that we just talk about it in house, like have an in house discussion on a lot of these issues, particularly the ones that you, uh, you know, post about and the videos you do. Um, so why do you view it as good, necessary? And why do you keep going on kind of social media? Why do you think it's a useful platform to, uh, you know, to, to do what you're doing? I think we, the unfortunate reality is we don't really live in um, the best times of Christendom right now. <laughs> so there's a lot of things to really be concerned about. And so my goal, like my whole, my whole goal isn't, um, you know, for the critics to believe it or not, isn't to cause division as much as it is just be like, all right, well, here's the thing. Like, what do you do with that thing then? And try to approach it in a way that's like as, as middle ground as I can while still presenting like, so for example, the, one of the reasons I do the full sermon reviews, which are literally almost two hours, every one of them is because I want to make sure we're not clickbaity. We're not causing unnecessarily division. We're not, you know, doing the things that are commonly done. And I don't think it's an issue and I don't think it's divisive because it literally is just asking the question, what about this then? Um, and if you, if you think it's divisive, well, okay, why do you think it's divisive then? Like what, why do you think that's so divisive? Because if it's causing some sort of visceral reaction in you, there's a reason for that. And it's either because you, you have a certain feeling about it. You just didn't post about it. You clearly care about it. You just didn't do what I did. And so I think that's part of it. The, well, I'm concerned about division. Well, okay. But the, the people you go to church with are dealing with the outcomes of whatever this person is saying or doing, or if it's not specifically that person, at least it's the thoughts and the theology that they're dealing with that they have to process through. So how, like, how are you helping them do that? And so that's, that's, that's my goal uh, for anybody to believe it or not is just to say, okay, well, here's this, what do you do with that? Like, this is what I'm <laughs> right. doing with it. So. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. It's, you know, cause <clears throat> we're not afraid of kind of, calling balls and strikes. Um, and, you know, we'll point out error in different teachers or something like that. And a lot of people are like, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. You, cause like they'll point out, you know, you're mad about Russell Moore, whoever it may be, you know, sowing division in the church, but aren't you just doing the same thing? And it's like, no, no, like it's it, same thing. No, it's, it's trying to just post clearly like mark and avoid, like, this is not truth. Um, you know, and I guess the, the big question is like, what use, like, do you view social media as like a public square where uh, people can share ideas and debate? Um, and if so, why do, why do so many Christians feel like it's so like cringe? Like they're so like, oh, I don't even want to get on Twitter. It's so like, whatever. Yeah. Well, it's definitely a public square. I don't think you could argue that it's not. I mean, this is where everyone goes for everything. I mean, Instagram is literally shopping and opinion and picture and video and everything. I mean, this is the, this is the public square along with obviously the other social media platforms too. And I think the idea, like if you don't want to go there, that's fine. I mean, it's, it's perfectly fine not to engage. I'm sure there's a lot of people that avoided the public square in all sorts of societies because they were like, I just don't want to deal with it. Right. Um, but I mean, it's definitely the place that again, everybody has to process through ideas. I mean, that's, you're living with a lens. So if you don't want your lens challenged, I can understand how that gets uncomfortable, but that's what the public square is for is to put something out there and then your idea butts up against that idea and you have to work through it. There's been a lot of ideas that I've thrown out there that a lot of people have not liked. And so it's just kind of like, all right, let me process through that. I mean, I've changed my opinion on a few things. When I started this account, I was an egalitarian and having to people push back and work through that and really look at it. Cause it's not an idea I had looked at before. I grew up in the Wesleyan church. That was just a default you know, idea. 
And so there's things that I think, again, if you're afraid to engage with different ideas, you're going to want to avoid social media uh, in some cases because of that, because it is going to push up against. Now, there is a point, I mean, in which you have to you have to know your limits to back off. One of the reasons I'm not on Twitter is because I'm like, I can't handle all of the comments across everything. So I'm just going to focus like one spot and then be done with that. And sometimes I regret even engaging in those comments. And so it's just a matter of saying, okay, obviously we have to engage, but how, what is my limit (laughs) on that? Um, Because I can find myself before I got off Twitter, um, I found myself, I mean, I'd be working and then I'm on the phone, working and on my phone. I'm like, this is distracting from the thing I'm supposed to be doing right now. And so it's just, it's knowing that balance, I guess. So. Yeah, for sure. Like I get YouTube comments and they, uh, you know, I'll have all these notifications anytime I go to upload a new video and I'm like, oh yeah, I should probably reply to those. And it's like, <laughs> I just don't, I mean, there's so the many. Algorithm like, wants you to, you have to. Yeah, yeah I know. It's insane. <laughs> and like, and my wife jokes, she'll, she's the one that reminds me on Monday mornings. Cause I don't, I'm not good at this stuff, man. Like, it's like, you know, if you're good at it, you can like schedule posts and you can do all the stuff and write the copy. But on Monday morning, she's like, hey, did you post the YouTube video? And I'm like, oh, shoot. Because like, and then I'll be sitting there like before we take the kids to school. It's like, okay, I'm writing copy right now. I'm supposed to post it on Twitter, Instagram, which Instagram account, Facebook, which Facebook page, you know, Mm -hmm. and then like, you want to share it with your friends. So it's just, it's a lot. So I totally, totally hear you on that with, uh, you know, there's a, there's kind of been some labels thrown around, at least that I'm aware of, um, regarding Mm -hmm. Uh, types of engagement like you might have or I might have on Twitter where it's, uh, you know, you've got, they call it trolling, Mm. they call it uh, engagement farming, or they'll call it, you know, discernment blog. And there's a lot of like, that's supposed to be a red flag word, like avoid, like, because it's just a discernment blog. Um, Whereas I find it interesting, like now I find it interesting. I think back then I saw it as like divisive or whatever. But now I'm like, no, this is actually helpful. I mean, I still may disagree with the the approach what they say but like i think it's good when when you're pointing out like your documentary on andy stanley i mean like really well done by the way no, thank um, you. And, and and obviously it's your most popular video on your youtube channel um but how do you reckon with that kind of stuff you know like it, why is discernment blogging if you want to use I, I don't think that's a redeemable term but let's say you did want to redeem it why is it good to do that yeah well, and I don't, just to be uh, upfront, I don't like the term discernment uh, ministry either. Like I, I have discernment in the title of the thing we do, but just because I think that's something everyone is supposed to do. Um, and that is also why, like, I try to do the content we do, especially even the, the, the video essays and the documentaries in the way that they're done is because it's supposed to be, hey, this is all the information I have. This is all the information I can give you. And then you make your own decision. I'm not over here clipping and trying to tell you what to do or what not to do. Um, and even when I get really close to that, I try to say, this is my opinion. You do whatever you want to do, but this is where I've come. And I've tried to separate myself from the quote unquote discernment ministries in the sense that I am trying to be as fair and gracious as possible. Um, Whereas a lot of those guys, again, I mean, some of this is just personality. I mean, some of it is, I mean, some people just, that is their personality. It's just like, here it is. I don't care if you're screaming that you're stupid. Like I, it's not my personality, but that is some people's personality. And so it's just a matter of, I think we're all called to be, discerning and how we approach it. I think a lot of people don't know how to do that and haven't been taught that very well. And that's really when I say, you know, we exist to help believers use biblical discernment in all aspects of life. That's what I mean. Like, I'm just saying, hey, this is this is how I've learned to do it. And these are some of the sources I've learned to do it from. And I think if you don't know how or you're, you're sort of wondering, this is what I would recommend you do um, and leave it in the lap of the people watching. It's the same thing we're doing now on Wednesday nights. We're just walking the people through how to just what to look for in the Bible, like just how to read it. And the idea is that a lot of people, even the pew don't know how to do that. And so it's just the same sort of aspect, like how, do, how are we discerning? This is how we're doing it. Um, and really kind of s- separating from that whole discernment ministry thing. Cause I just don't think that's often it's not very helpful, but sure. 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 Yeah. So if, all these questions, I'm, I, I rarely have an influencer on my show. I typically have like <laughs> academics or other people. So well, I'm not an <laughs> academic, so <laughs> you're a memester. So yeah. I'm asking a lot of these questions because I feel like you have a lot of experience in answering these questions already. Mm-hmm. And these are questions that keep coming up. But one of them, one of the concerns is like, you know, 
all you ever do is post critiques. You're just mm. a negative influence. Uh, you know, like you're just building a platform on tearing other Christians down. Like, have heard you had that, that a lot? Oh, have you heard that like a lot? Every other, every other comment. Yeah. 100%. What do you think about that? Like, how, what do you make of that accusation? So, there's two things I think if I really dig down to the reasoning behind it, I think there's two things that really come from it. One, we're not, we've sort of been taught either upfront or just sort of subversively that you're not supposed to question the leadership over you. Like if you do that, you are, you are doing the wrong thing. Now, sometimes that's more blatant, like don't question God's anointed. Like that's the most blatant it gets. But sometimes people just feel bad. Like some of, one of the things that I, when I'm teaching this class on Wednesdays is like, like I want you if you feel like I've not handled this scripture well, to come to me after service and ask a question. I don't want you to feel like that's not an open road for you. And I think sometimes people just like, you can't, why are you, you can't question what they're doing. They're a believer. I'm like, well, they handle this terribly. They need to, I want to be told. Do they not want to be told? Do you not want to know how to look at it? And I think part of it is we're just, we're really, we don't like that idea. And secondly, we've been so conditioned that anything negative is bad. Like any critique is bad that anytime we hear critique, it's wrong. So even today, like I posted a meme about just Stanley and Beg and their base idea of approaching a certain topic a certain way is the same. By no means was I saying that they are the same theologically. By no means was I saying that they're even on the same theological path or even in the same theological camp, but their reasoning seems to me to be the exact same thing. And just saying that threw every Beg fan into like just feral mode. And it's, it's a, it's a matter of like, we just can't do it. We just, even if it is, even if we're not saying like, oh, cancel them, throw everything, throw the, take their books, throw them away. Like, even if you're not saying that, you're just like, I think there's an issue here. And then everybody from every camp, because certain camps are like, well, you do that over there. We don't do that over here. Yes, you do. You have your golden calf, just like everybody else does. And we just don't like it. And I think that's the two things we've been kind of conditioned, not, we don't want to question it. And then if you touch our person, well, you better believe they can do no wrong. And it's just because we've gained so much from them that we hate to hear anything, even like a little critique bad. So I think that's 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 part of it is that it seems divisive when it's just like, yeah, but what a, what about that? Like, what do you do with that point there? Right. Like, you're just yeah. going to let it go. And I again, I just, we're just not comfortable. We're just we are as believers. We're just not comfortable with anybody questioning the people we like, we're totally cool. If you tear apart the people we don't like, but if you question the people we like, then you're a problem. And even if it's legit on both sides, we just don't like it. Yeah. 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 That's a huge problem I see. And that's, you know, something God, by God's grace, you know, one of the uh, two of the figures that for me were unassailable and unquestionable were like Tim Keller and Russell Moore. Um, and listeners to this show will know that. And once you get free of that kind of uh, mind trap where, you know, nobody can question these people, all of a sudden you can have a lot more uh, humility and mm -hmm. also a lot more fun because like even guys that I still like, like I wrote a book and it's on John Frame and some of my friends disagree with John Frame and they'll tell me all about it. And I'm like, okay, cool. Like I don't, yeah. it's not like you can't question people. And so mm -hmm. I think it's just a big discipleship issue for people yeah. and the social media stuff just accelerates that kind of, uh, whether, whether you want to go so far as to call it idolization or just kind of like, uh, you know, loyalty in a good way. Yeah, loyalty uh, to something. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so yeah. Talk to me about you know one thing online that you'll see, and this is another scare word that a lot of people use. They'll, they'll talk about trolling. Oh, you're just mm -hmm. trolling. You're you're a troll. You know, and uh, I'm not above that. I've done that on Twitter. You know, and ask either through memes or asking questions, uh, whether whether to be provocative or to be you know genuinely you know ask a uh, decent question. Mm -hmm. how, are, how are we as Christians to think about that kind of engagement? Because I think most Christians, maybe it goes back to your answer for the first one, most Christians look at that as bad behavior. And yet they mm -hmm. can't point out in the Bible what, why it's bad. Like why, mm -hmm. what law am I violating here? So why do you think that is? How is trolling helpful or unhelpful? Yeah, I think it's intent really. I think I, I'm a terrible troll. Like I've tried it and I'm bad at it. Um, but I think really is intent. Like the, again, with a lot of things, it's a matter of like, all right, are you, are you poking just for the sake of just like being vindictive or are you poking to get to the bottom of why somebody is actually maybe thinking incorrectly and you're using the form of trolling to do that. I mean, some, I think you could argue of Jesus' parables are that is, is, is just poking and taking a modern equivalent and being like, and I mean, I mean, you really have the, the, 
it's escaping my mind now. Um, anyway, you have him do that with a few parables. And I, again, I think it's intent. I mean, it's just a matter of like, I want to set the world on fire and watch it burn. Like, I'm not sure that's necessarily the best approach, but I think again, if you're doing so to poke, to get to the motivation of, of people's real motives there to get them to think about it. I mean, that's really the beauty of a meme. That that's what I found. Like you have memes that are just silly and stupid, but there's some memes there that like you, it hits you hard. Cause you're like, Oh hmm, yeah, maybe I wasn't maybe. A, okay. That kind of uh, that, that lightens things up and kind of opens some windows here for me. Um, so I, I think it could be used in a really negative way. And I think the word itself, people just attribute negativity to. But again, the idea is like you're presenting an idea. If, if the idea is to kind of break down your faulty thought process, you're presenting an idea in a way that's really unexpected and subversive, like a lot of comedy to, to show you that you're just as, as wrong as everybody else on this subject. And you just don't, you didn't know that. Um, yeah. So yeah. That makes sense. And then, you know, one of the last ones that I want to get into a little bit of, uh, Andy Stanley and the meme you made about beg as well. Um, Cause I have lots of thoughts on that, but I want to hear from you. So mm -hmm. with you, your local church member, um, you know, how, how, have, how has your local church responded when they kind of find your account and has anyone kind of been like, Oh my goodness, like, I cannot believe that, that Michael's out here doing this. This is, and they go to your pastor and they want, they want him to, discipline you or something like that have you had that experience what what has that been like how have you handled that yeah nobody has gone to the pastor yet about it um i think a lot of them uh, the the way that a lot of them have found out about what i do is basically the sermon reviews on youtube most of the i mean um our church is about 50 50 as far as like pretty much 45 and up and 45 and under and so a lot of the people that are 45 and up have no clue what instagram is and they're not on it typically um and the ones that are uh, those are the ones that ironically find me on youtube um, and then the other people are obviously on more on TikTok, Instagram. No one's gone to my pastor, uh, for disciplinary measures yet. And most of them have found, um, like what was really funny is cause it tracks when like the downloads come through about the sermon review guides. And one of them came through one day and it was somebody from church. I'm like, Oh, okay. Tanya's downloaded the guide. I'm gonna have to talk to her about that. And so it's just a matter of like, um, they, all the feedback I've got so far has been helpful. Some of them don't get the approach so much sometimes in the memes but uh, as far as like the sermon reviews and that sort of thing they found that helpful but again and i think this is part of it we're in relationship and community together so they know my heart behind it anyway where i think that some of that is a little lost on the internet which i mean there's not a whole lot you can do to bridge that gap but i think that's the main difference uh, no church discipline measures have been put because they're just like oh, okay we know your heart we know where you're coming from we know what you're going for so yeah. Have you ever done a, uh, a sermon review of your own pastor? Cause that would be hilarious. I have it. In fact, in fact, he came up one day. He's like, just, if you could not, if you could just come to me, that would be great. And I'm like, Oh, don't believe, believe me. I would, I would come to you. We've talked a few times, honestly, about some of his sermons before. Uh, but yeah, he was just like, if you could not do that, that'd be cool. <laughs> so yeah, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> I've always joked that, uh, cause on Monday mornings we do a kind of sermon review for us for whoever preached. Mm -hmm. And I always think it would be funny if we did those, like recorded those and published them because, uh, yeah. you know, I think most of our sermons are pretty good. I don't know if they'd make it onto, uh, Michael Moore's honest youth pastor channel. Uh, well, somebody has to suggest enough. it. Somebody would have to suggest it. I work <laughs> off a list. I don't pick them anymore. So if somebody sends something in, man, I'm just going down a list. <laughs> That's hilarious. All right. Um, well, let's talk about, you know, you did this documentary, first of all, really well done. I was, I was surprised, not because I didn't ex think you could do it based on following you on Instagram, but more like it's actually really high quality. Um, and he kind of tracked the life of Andy Stanley and Andy Stanley in the last years has kind of come out, uh, very, uh, pro LGBTQ. Uh, he's talked about unhitching the old Testament from the new. Um, and look, he's got mass appeal. I mean, back when I used to watch more TV, he was coming on on Saturday nights after SNL. Mm -hmm. Uh, he had his kind of talk there and most preachers I know have read his book, communicating for a change. Um, and so he's a very popular figure and I still think most evangelicals don't know how bad it is, but maybe what were some things that you learned about Andy Stanley as you kind of put together kind of like kind of a bio of who he is mm -hmm. and what he teaches, what were some things that you learned that you think would be important to highlight? 
Um, I, th a lot of what came out, and one of the reasons I, I, I've done the ones I've done is because I wanted to know more than from the sermon, like what actually drives them. And so from a 3000 foot view of either their books and their sermons and their podcasts, I kind of get a little bit of that. And so I, from him, I learned, I mean, he really has and has had for, I mean, pretty much since he started in, in, in any sort of ministry, he wants people to know Jesus. That seemed to be the theme. Like it's, uh, he, he wants them to know that. Now he does seem to have, and this is again, just everything I'm about to say just comes from what I saw. So I could be wrong, but everything I researched, he, he does seem to be a little bit reactionary from, from more of a fundamentalist Christianity that he got from his dad. Like that seemed to leave a little bit of a bad taste in his mouth. And so when he does sort of start North Point inadvertently, um, because of everything that sort of went down, um, at that church is his goal was like, I want unchurched people in here so they can hear about Jesus. That seemed to be the goal from the get go. Now I've described it, uh, talked to somebody else actually just a few hours ago and I described it, his sort of his journey as sort of chasing that rabbit. Like that is his rabbit that he's chasing. And what seems to have happened through like all of these sort of years of starting North point and kind of chasing that rabbit is that. He's sort of adapting his method as he goes because he's not caught it yet. Like he wants everybody to like, I want you to know about Jesus. And so as he's going, like he's sort of stripping off different parts of methodology that he thinks that, you know, that'll help him get to that, that end goal. So like his, some of his first messages that I could have access to, not a lot of them are available online, but I did get some of them is, I mean, he referenced the Old Testament, he preached from the Old Testament a few times. Like there was a lot more scriptural references. And as you go along, like the Old Testament starts to kind of disappear and we're on the new and we're on the epistles a little bit. And then as you keep going, that sort of goes away a little bit. And then you get to the last few years where it's like, all right, well, just Jesus then. Like, we'll just, we'll just talk about Jesus and just these things. These are the things you need to focus on. And it just seems the the longer he chases this goal, this rabbit of, hey, I want you to know about Jesus. He just keeps losing things along the way to where I don't think he would call it compromise, but it's definitely what it seems like is that, well, that's a problem for you. So we're not going to talk about that then. And then this is a problem. So we're going to kind of ignore that And to the point to where now I think what's happened, honestly, in a short story is that he thought the attractional ministry that he had that was juxtaposed to his dad's type of fundamentalism would attract people. And so he ran people through that ministry for a decade. And when that didn't work, then he's like, well, that that didn't go the way I thought it was going to go. And then so he's like, well, now all these people are a good number of them have left the church or deconstructed. So how do I get a hold of them now? And so this is sort of the mode and era that we're in of trying to get to them. But every time he shifts, he just drop. He seems like he dropped something else off to where now, like what he says on paper versus what he actually does is different. And so it's just like, well, where does this lead? It doesn't lead anywhere what good, which is really why out of the four that I've done of those video essays, that's the most depressing one, <laughs> because it's not really an open ended question what direction we're going here. Like it's fairly defined and it doesn't look great. So, yeah, and it, it really is a helpful case study because he is kind of a darling of bad model, you know, like, mm -hmm. yeah, um, he's popular. He's well liked. He's on talk shows. He has books lots of people in the church and so people look at him as a if this is kind of the prototype of attractional church i think to me it's more of a caricature at this point mm -hmm. of like that's what this results in is if you bake into your ministry the seeker sensitive approach then this is where you end up this is the reductio ad absurdum of the logic of your approach to ministry yeah um and so yeah i, I find the the documentary is actually very helpful because I, I too, I'm like that where I, you know, whether it's Stephen Furtick or um, anybody really like knowing their story helps me understand where they're coming from yeah. and why they do the things they do. And so I think that's been uh, really helpful that you've done there. You, you obviously posted a meme today that upset some people uh, yeah. connecting some of the logic with Alistair Begg. So for the listener, I'll, I'll describe briefly for the listener. Um, recently, I think it was an email or something, a conversation he had with a grandmother. This is a pastor of, I believe it's Parkside Church. Mm -hmm. Very famous, has a ministry. I think it's Truth for Life. Is that what it's yeah. called? Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people listen to it. I don't really listen to it as much, but he has a Scottish accent. And as I always say, British and Scottish and Australian accents are like 
they they make Americans lose logic. Like they just immediately go like, I can trust this person. Yeah, like you so sound guy, really smart. Yeah, you must be brilliant. <laughs> um, and you you hear a redneck or you hear somebody from the south, and you're like, yeah, you're probably not not yeah. smart. Uh, which is often not the case, the opposite. But with Alistair, he advised a grandmother. A grandmother had a grandchild that was getting married. I believe it was a trans nuptu nuptial ceremony. Mm -hmm. And the grandmother was like, do I go? And Alistair's advice was like, do you know where, does the daughter, the grandchild know where you stand? Yes, uh, know, knows that I'm opposed. And then he basically said, you should go and you should bring a gift, you know, basically because you don't want to be perceived as a fundamentalist. And he mm -hmm. did a sermon on this recently. I, I can put a link to that sermon in the show notes where he kind of doubled down and he went off on the prodigal son and very bad exegesis. I, uh, I recommend a sermon <laughs> review for you, uh, Michael. This would be a great <laughs> sermon review. I did um, it. Okay, great. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's kind of the what's what's happened. And it, I think what's unique about this one, dude, is like, you know, for a lot of other guys, there's kind of a degree of Shoden fraud where you're kind of like, yeah, like, finally, he's said who he finally says, it. like, I suspected he was a lib. Mm -hmm. And now he's saying it. And with Alistair, it's sad. It makes me sad. Mm -hmm. I don't want that. And I it just is a different feeling. Because like I've his, his illustration on the man on the middle cross said I could come like, man, that's like a powerful illustration. That's really yeah. good stuff. And yet, what do you think is the, the common logic that you would connect Andy Stanley with Alistair Begg here? Well, so I, I mentioned, so I did a, a live stream review of it last night because I was like, I'm not going to have time. This is the only time. Let's just do it. And the, I said in the middle of it that this sounds like just exactly like Andy Stanley's logic. And the only, the only thing that connects the two that I even see and I mean, agree, disagree, plenty of people already have, is that Alistair's point at the very even beginning is that my thought process was, how does the grandmother retain a relationship with her grandchild? That's, he's, he, in his own words, this is what drove his decision. And I thought that's like, I've, I've looked at a whole bunch of Andy Stanley's content and that is always the driving force is what will maintain this relationship. That's, that's the whole unconditional conference is we don't want to break the relationship. So how do we keep the relationship? And even though these two are like, I've already said, and like entirely two different theological camps, they, they have, if you ask them any other question, they would come to probably a different conclusion on it almost. And not that even Alistair would land in the same kind of, end goal that Andy would, but their starting point is the same. Their, their reasoning is the same. How do you maintain this relationship? And so that, um, I know we don't like to think, like you said, I mean, I've listened to Alistair a ton. I think he's, he's typically a really good exegete, which is why this sermon was so disappointing. And, um, that that's the commonality is the relationship over everything. Um, whatever it takes to maintain that, that's how far we go. Neglecting the reality that there is 100% of time where we as Christians draw the line. I have a lot of atheists and non-believer and friends that are far quicker to draw lines in the sand than any believer I know about how far they'll go on something. And believers, we have a very clear mandate about like, okay, what do we do as believers? How do we live? What do we do it? We don't, we're not great at that a lot of the time, but like the idea is it's there. And then we're so wishy-washy on like where we actually do, we overcompensate on compassion and we kind of way overdo it on compromise in the name of compassion. And I think, um, again, there's, there's plenty of really good advice that he could have given her, but the go and bring a Bible was not the greatest, I don't think. So, yeah, it, it's wild, you know, like this, cause I think the whole thing was, uh, compassion versus conviction i'm like stop mm -hmm. pitting those two against each other yeah i like, just stop doing that you don't need to pit those and and when we when we interpret loving our neighbor or maintaining the relationship we interpret it through a worldly lens of kind of unity at all cost uh peace as the world defines peace not as god defines peace mm -hmm. and jesus defines peace then yeah this is where this logic leads and i see this tripping up a lot of christians because they still have the logic of Stanley, the attractional kind of maintain the relationship, reach the non-believer. And at this point, there's there's even a conversation about the 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 idol of evangelism. Like, have we made evangelism so like the uh, the reason for ministry? Mm -hmm. You know, like churches exist to reach the lost. That's it. 
you know, mm-hmm. so if anything gets in the way of that, we don't want to offend. What's the um, whole Craig Goshell, anything short of sin? We'll just do anything short of sin to get to you. And it's just kind of like, well, there's there's a lot of things short of that <laughs> that we don't do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's just wild, man. And yeah, the, the exegetical leap from prodigal son repenting, coming back to the father and leaving his lost life behind and celebrating that. Uh, kind of pitting the older brothers of fundamentalist in that context, it was just really sad. I mean, really, yeah. that's just really poor, poor exegesis. Well, and uh, the thing that really bothered me, I, I've had to answer these very questions with people within my church or within very close friends and family that I know. So this isn't a foreign question, nor is it a thing that I, I haven't had to answer. There's plenty of really good answers. First of all, I mean, that, that was what was so frustrating is that there's plenty of good advice about continuing to be a loving grandma in the life of the granddaughter, which, or whatever, the grandchild that she seemed like she already was. Like, it's not that this is the only situation in which she could do that. And, and if the grandchild did cut the relationship off because she didn't go, like, that's not on you. There's a lot of conversations I've had to have with parents about just your, that was a decision your child made. Like, it, you, there's only so much weight you bear in this two-way unity relationship. And because you didn't go X, Y, Z far enough for them doesn't mean you didn't do everything you were supposed to do. And so don't take on the weight you're not supposed to take on just because they're trying to get you to go further than you, you're ever called to go. And it's just a weird, he seemed like he was wrestling through this whole pursuit of holiness versus loving your enemy. And I'm like, how are those even in battle with one another? And how do you, a pastor that's been around for years, decades, how are you battling through that in a way that you can't communicate clearly? I mean, I'm not, Yeah. I, I I have a bachelor's degree in youth ministry and I know that, like I'm not intelligent by any stretch and you're up here telling me that these two things can't like they battle together and i'm like throughout church history those things haven't battled together like christians have lived faithfully with both uh, without compromising and it's just kind of a it was a frustrating sermon to watch so yeah no it's it's a frustrating thing and you know it's uh it'd be easy i think nowadays to be cynical and i can slip into this where it's like if you have a big platform you have a big name i assume you're compromised <laughs> it's just like we're gonna fight. it'll come out you know yeah. and it doesn't have to be the way i don't think it is that way mm. um you know but i think anytime these things pop up it's a it's a reminder of our own humanity and limitedness yeah. and it should humble us because it's like dude if that guy can be a pastor for 40 years and slip up on this really simple um issue even even if dude he would have said you know it's a wisdom issue and you don't agree with my wisdom, you think it's unwise. I hear that. Uh, maybe it was unwise, but you know, it is the advice I gave at the time. And I'm going to be thinking about that, you know, like that would be like a, a, a human way to interact with his critics, but just labeling them all fundies is, is wild. Um, but yeah, I, I don't want, I guess my heart with all this stuff, whether it's social media engagement or, you know, all these teachers is like, it's easy for Christians to almost build their own deconstruction path if they don't trust, if they don't like have anybody, Mm -hmm. ultimately Jesus, uh, but they don't have a community or a church. And so where do you see kind of like positives in the church today? Where do you see kind of like good momentum going? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I I hear stories all the time about people that don't have great local churches. I, I just, I'll be honest with you. I don't know what that is like because I do. And I think there are plenty of really good churches out there and you could be as cynical as, I mean, you can find a reason not to like, any church you go to. There's people I go to church with that I politically disagree with, that I theologically disagree with, that we could have all sorts of things that we don't disagree with, but we are in community together as believers loving each other as a family. And so if you allow yourself to be put like in a place like that, as long as it's theologically sounded, it's biblically based, it's Jesus loving, you're going to have that anyway. That's never not a thing. Uh, But if you can, again, be humble enough to enter into relationship with other people, and again, just like with the public square, be willing to push and be pushed on and be sharpened and mentored and discipled. That is an incredibly healthy thing. I think the worst thing you can do is not be into a local church. If you let social media disciple you, you will 100% be back and forth on the waves of doctrine and philosophy all day long. You won't know where you're at. You won't have any anchor clue what you believe. Being plugged into a local church, like as much hate as local church gets, is the hope of the world. It is where you need to be plugged in as a believer. And I think 
one of the reasons that every deconstructionist I know isn't in a church is because that that's what happens in churches. You get sharpened, you get challenged, your ideas are pushed back against. And if you don't like that, you leave it. And then you go find your little hate the church group somewhere else outside of it. Um, and to learn and to live and to love inside of that, that, that the gathering of saints is the healthiest place you can be. It's hard. Of course, it's hard at times. I and mean, you're not going to love everybody all the time in there, but it's good for you. And I think, again, what's good about the local church is the local church. I mean, there's bad parts. We can point those out our day. But in general, like it is the best place and the most healing place um, if it's ran in a way that it's supposed to be ran. And there are sure. way there are way more of those than there are bad ones. All you ever hear yeah. is about the bad ones, but there are great local churches. And most of the time, I'll, I'll say this to end my comment, most of them are the little small itty bitty ones that you would never think that you would ever like. But if you go to them, you're gonna find probably, not all the time, but a lot of the time, a community of believers that loves you and is welcoming you and to love them and live Jesus together. So. Amen, brother. That's great. Well, we'll close out on that uh, comment. Um, obviously, I'm going to direct people to YouTube, Instagram, any other websites or anything you want to plug here at the end uh, before we let you go. No, those two will be fine. I think they can. Okay, great. Of I'll, put your, there. I'll put your branded merch store in there as well. So Thank people, you. <laughs> you can go buy your not a brand content. Yeah. <laughs> Which is great. <laughs> Michael, sorry to roast you at the end. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Michael. Thank you for having me.